thing. Um, and we kind of called this sermon King of My Castle just to be a little bit funny uh, because, you know, <clears throat> at least when I was growing up, it was kind of one of these macho guy things to say, you know, this is my castle, you know. You ever heard anybody say that? You ever say that? Never said that. You never said that? Go home tonight <clears throat> when your wife is standing there, you know, and she's got that broom in her hand and she just got done putting four kids to bed. And <laughs> I'm going to somebody else's castle, see? But you know it's their castle, right? Yeah. And he's bigger than me. He's bigger than me, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, but uh, just a, so because we're talking about marriage tonight, hey, I did want to do this before I forget. Um, I, want, I need to know this, and I know there is a, some long-standing marriages in this room. Who has, who has been married the longest in here? Okay, put your, everybody put your hands up. If you're over five years, this is we're side we're going to do this. Put your, put your hand down if you're under five years. Okay, if you're under 10. If you're under 15. Okay, if you're under 20. Look at the hands. One, two, three, four. Okay, over 20, yeah, that's fine. 25, 25 years you've been married, 25 years. Hey, if you're in here and you ain't been married 25 years, you might want to look at who's holding their hands up. You can talk to these dudes. Come on, Jax, like I got to put my hand down. 30 years. If you've been married 30 years or longer, keep your hand up. 35 years. Uh-oh, Daryl, these old guys got you, man. 36, 36, 37. 38, it's Jim, it's Jim and Jack now. Why are these guys lying? 38, 39, 39, 40, 41, 42 years, 43, Jack wins, 43 years, 42. Jack, how long have you been married? 49 years. I got a gift card for you to Texas Roadhouse, Chili's, or Amazon. Fifty on March fifteenth. Congratulations, Jack! Jack, you gonna come up here and pick one of these when you're ready? Uh, yeah, let's give this guy a hand. Fifty years. Now wait a minute. Is this cumulatively to the same woman? <laughs> she looks the same. <laughs> Roadhouse is that one right there, sir. Wow. Give that to your wife. <laughs> Who are putting up with you for 50 years. Okay, who just got married? Okay, youngest marriage in the room. One year. Less than one year. Two years? Two years? Anybody less than two years? Or, or Alex, don't count. <laughs> you got to be married. Okay, Chili's or Amazon? All right. Anybody engaged? Is there anybody engaged? Is anybody engaged? No, Alex is not engaged. Oh, oh, son. <laughs> but I do pray for his wife. You know what I mean? I do pray for his wife. And I, I mean... Man, I'm going to have to keep praying for his wife. <laughs> I know, this is bad, isn't it, Alex? Uh, all right, I'm going to give this one at the end. All right, so uh, one quick housekeeping thing. Hey, did you guys get this? Me- did you, anybody, everybody get this message about this new Frontline little thing? So this says Frontline is the men's ministry at Beyond Church. Our goal is to help men live the victorious life that God intended by helping them develop their relationship with God and other men. We've discovered that it takes more than just smiles and handshakes on Sunday morning to be victorious in life. It takes personal and focused effort to have truly meaningful relationships. A fire team is a small team's concept within Frontline and is simply a group of three to four men working together to ensure that each man is connected, prayed for, and has the resources needed. These are normal guys just like you. However, these men are dedicated to being a church to each other 24-7, 365. 
The team member that handed you this card is obviously interested in seeing you walk in victory as well. Get back with them today and ask how you can get involved. And this is just, if you guys aren't on a fire team today, uh, hopefully you, by me reading this, it means something to you now, if you didn't know what it meant before. But we've had a, a lot of success um, in these teams. And if you're not tied into one, um, I highly encourage you to just touch base with myself or somebody that um, you know your buddies with. This is a buddies concept. We want guys that are buds uh, on teams together. Um, but if you got any feedback on something like this that would help you as a guy that's on a team or um, that's leading a team to kind of like hand off to somebody just to communicate the idea, you know what I mean? Because sometimes it's hard to put words around things. Let me know. Or if you're using this or have or do, let me know. Um, because we're just looking for ways to, you know, Get the idea across to a new guy. You know what I mean? Um, we've had tons and tons of success um, just in relationships with these teams. So, uh, okay, husbandry. Man, I'm glad the core is here tonight because this is, this is a hard one. Probably one of the harder ones, honestly. Um, because uh, how many of you guys, um, let's just do a random, random poll. Raise your hand if you feel like you ever saw somebody in your life that had a tremendous, tremendous marriage. Pretty good group of dudes, okay. Did you have anybody in your life <clears throat> that you felt like, I never, ever, ever want to be like that husband-wife couple? How many guys do you think, okay, you can raise your hand or not. <clears throat> How many of you have somebody in your life right now that, you feel like it's modeling a good marriage that you could go to and talk to them about marriage if you wanted to. Okay. How many of you feel like you could be that to somebody else? Okay. Uh, how many of you guys, um, you know, feel like marriage is a strong suit for you? Okay. Okay. How many of you guys read a book this year, because we're getting ready to lapse into 2020, focused on being a better husband? Okay. Um, all right, that's good. That's good. Just kind of get your brain thinking, you know what I mean, about the people around you, yourself. Would you raise your hand if I said, how many guys think that they should maybe focus in the next year on maybe being or learning or studying on being a better husband, right? Okay. So here's the interesting thing. Marriage is the foundation of really the kingdom of God, if you think about it. It's how God brought about the human race to taking dominion over the earth, right? It's the cornerstone of a church, it's a married couple, right, that has children, that models marriage, that get married. Those children get married. They have children, right? <clears throat> and what's interesting about it is, is that um, it's, not, it's, it's just another one of those subjects that some kind of can fall in a vacuum, right? We just don't teach a lot on it Sunday mornings or Wednesdays because it's complicated. And it doesn't necessarily apply to everybody that sits in the body all the time. A lot of single people, a lot of young people in the body. What's up, man? My man, Jose. Glad you made it. Um, but here we go. Um, tonight, I want to kind of dig into what it means to be positioned in a marriage in the way God would have you. And um, this is not really going to be like the seven steps to a perfect marriage. I'm too short. <laughs> uh I heard a guy I listened to the other day say, we live in a silver bullet society where everybody wants the silver bullet. They want that one thing that's going to fix that really hard thing in their life, like the four steps to a great sex life or the nine steps to, nine would be too many, like three steps to, you know, like perfect abs, you know. So I have not found those three steps to perfect abs. So... But the thing is, right, like I'm going to kind of break this down into a couple categories tonight, but we both know this is a, we, this is a 
a way too complicated of a subject to, to really categorize it or whatever, but just to kind of organize thoughts, uh, I kind of break it down, broke it down into three different sections. But um, before we get started, I really just want to pray and kind of take authority over this place, and then we'll get, we'll get cranked up. So if you guys will just bow your head. Dear Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for these men, these faithful men. You know, this is the, the men, these are the men that you talk about in your word. Guiding the body, your body, your people, faithful men. We thank you for calling them out. We thank you for them having the courage and the faith to respond. We just ask that you would um, speak to each one of them in, in a way that um, <clears throat> their heart hears best tonight with the message that you have for them. And we take authority right now in Jesus' name over this place. And we cast out any spirit that's not of you. The spirit of uh, anxiety, fear, frustration, unforgiveness, all of them. Anything that would impede and be a stumbling block for these men, we cast them out and bind them right now in Jesus' name. They have no authority here. We just thank you for your son and this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Ephesians 5, 23. Guys, that's going to be heavy in the, in the uh, scriptures tonight. They're all going to be on the board behind me because of these fine gentlemen in AVL. Um, and so we're going to start in Ephesians 5, 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Okay. So, what does it mean to be the head? Well, Webster says, <clears throat> Webster says that basically this makes you the organizational leader. And you could read, I, we could go through what Webster says, but at the end of the day, the head of something, um, you know, is the point of authority. It is the point of responsibility. It's the point of institutional uh, leadership. And what this is saying is, is that you are the head of your wife. You're the leader, you're the point of authority, you're in charge. So um, to kind of get this off to the wrong foot right, right off the bat, what this means is, is that when it comes to your marriage, okay, you own it. You are the point of responsibility for it. So the stress in your marriage, the peace in your marriage, the prosperity in your marriage, the joy, the debt in your marriage, the prayer life, the anxiety, the sickness, the spirituality, the addiction, the stress in sexual areas, all of that, you're the head of that. You're the point of authority. You're the point of responsibility in your marriage for those things. So, at least whenever I contemplated those thoughts, I thought, wait a minute, I didn't, that's not all mine. Like, I'm not exactly the person that brought a lot of that to my marriage. <laughs> like there was two of us, I had my baggage, she had hers, and you know, what about that stuff that's not mine? And um, I want to look at 2 Corinthians 5.21 um, because when we look at Ephesians, we see that Je just as Jesus was the head of the church, we're the head of the marriage. So in 2 Corinthians, we see, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. And so here's a man named Jesus who was made sin when he didn't know any sin. He, was, he ended up with baggage that he didn't bring to the table either. Right? And this is the role that we're called to in our marriage. Whatever it is that was brought into your marriage, you own. That's yours. As the head, just like whatever Jesus had to face when he came to this earth, he didn't create it all, all the problems that is, right? But he was brought to bear it. So if we own these things, for what Jesus couldn't choose, uh, for what Jesus didn't choose, he created a pathway out of those things. Uh, and that's our responsibility in a marriage as well. So let's look at uh, 1 John 1, 9. Okay, so this says, <clears throat> if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what we see here is that a confession of sins brings a pardon, right? And so what's interesting is, is that Jesus, though he didn't bring all of this, uh, uh, you know, he bore it all. And for us, as we look at, um, 
you know, how are we to handle these things in our marriage that aren't necessarily brought to the table by us, um, we see that there's a special power in confession and a special power in um, bringing these things to God and how he handles them in that confession. So um, as an example, you guys remember the, the story of the rich young ruler we see in Mark. And the rich young ruler um, comes to Jesus and he basically names off how he has followed, you know, all the commandments. He's done everything that Jesus has asked him to do. And um, I don't know that that one was in there, Colby, Mark 10, uh, 21 through 22. But Jesus basically said, hey, great, well done, go sell everything that you have and come and follow me. And the guy couldn't do it, right? But what was interesting about that encounter is that that man, that rich young ruler, as he walked away, when Jesus went to the cross, what he did was he created a way for that man to become a, a disciple later. Right? He paved the way for that rich young ruler that wasn't, he wasn't ready at that point to sell everything and to follow Jesus. But Jesus went on to the cross and created a way for him to find salvation later, for him to find discipleship later, right? And so everything in our marriage is not necessarily something that we can fix right now, but Jesus created a way for us to um, bring those things into resolution throughout time, right? So for us, we have that same responsibility as husbands. And so we can't just go home tonight and fix all the issues that we have with our wives, right? But it's our responsibility to create a way, to create a path, to, to cast a vision, to uh, open up conversation, to um, lay a, uh, a foundation of uh, being able to resolve those issues over time. And so um, this first phase, uh, with that kind of being our foundation, that we're supposed to be the head of our marriage just as Jesus was head of the church, that Jesus bore things that he didn't bring to the table, right? And that he long-term created a path of um, salvation, right? Or created a path of conflict resolution for everybody. That's our responsibility in our marriage. And we can't do that if we're not willing to own all of those things that are a part of our marital life that, um, you know, are the goods and the bads, okay? So, with that being said, now I want to just kind of break each one of these things down into kind of um, thought processes or, or, or ideas. And the first part of this is that um, I'll give you a setup, you know, so you've got this couple, and they don't have to be young, but they get married. And because, you know, you can be young and young in marriage, or you can be a little bit older and young in marriage. Like, I met a guy today that's 76, and he's been married like five years, you know what I mean? And so uh, he's a little bit older, but young in marriage, right? So this couple, they, and, and you can apply this to you. You know, maybe you had the Camelot story. You met your wife in third grade, and y'all dated through high school, and you've been married 50 years, almost, Jack. When did you met, meet Dina? When did you meet Verdina? Seven or eight. There you go, Camelot, right? <laughs> and maybe like you abstained all through your premarital years and saved sex for after marriage and, you know, like you got two perfect kids. Now, maybe that's your story. I don't know. Maybe, um, maybe you got your, your wife uh, and you like got together before you got married and maybe you've been divorced or maybe whatever your, you know, situation is. Um, but what happens is, in that new part of that relationship, when you're married, um, there's a certain level of patience and forgiveness, and there's like this buffer zone, and you overlook things. You know what I mean? Like, she doesn't really bring up that you leave your underwear on the floor, and you really don't bring up the fact that she's like, you know, <laughs> hair everywhere. Hair everywhere. <laughs> yeah, like there is a dead animal in my drain almost every day. <laughs> Have y'all had that experience? My wife don't watch these, so I can say what I want. <laughs> huh? 
<laughs> king of the castle. That's right. All right. I, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, you're just like super forgiving, you know, you just like, but at the end of the day, uh, at some point that wears off, right? And um, what's interesting is uh, we as men have a real hard time with being attached to uh, things that threaten us, things that intimidate us, things that embarrass us, things that we feel disrespected by, things that we feel um, just bring a negative light upon us. And over time, um, we find ourselves embracing what makes us feel comfortable, what makes us feel powerful, what makes us feel confident, okay? And what happens is, I'm going to kind of coin this as an Adam and Eve moment. And when we look at kind of the, the, the trend of marital issues, this really goes back to them and how Adam handled the very first issue that he had with Eve. And we can look at this in Genesis 3, 9 through 12. There's this little story, and it's, it's pretty short. But um, this is verse 9. So, yeah, so the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Hast thou eaten of that tree that I told you not to over and over again? And man said, The woman whom thou hast gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. So Adam throws Eve under the bus, right? And why did he do that? Because she brought negative light upon him. She was about to bring accountability for the decision that he made upon, for, upon him uh, in, the, in the sight of God. And Adam's like, hey, you gave me this chick, not me. I didn't pick her out, right? But we can look back, if we look back at, at Genesis uh, 2.23, we see that Adam was stoked in the beginning. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she has taken out of man. This is him declaring that she's a piece of me. She's a part of me. Right? And so it's, it doesn't take long until we get into chapter 3 and things go wrong. And all of a sudden, Adam's having a hard time owning Eve. Right? And the responsibility of his choice that that is coming to him from his violation of what God told him to do. And this happens in our marriage, in marriages, in our relationships. And it really doesn't, I'll be honest with you, it doesn't matter how long it takes for it to happen. It's going to happen. And the reason it's going to happen is because you have an enemy at work in your life. Okay? But at the end of the day, we, ask that we have to back up and we have to ask ourselves, what changed between when Adam was willing to own Eve and when Adam was wanting to disown her. And what happened was sin. Because when they took a bite out of that apple and they violated God's command to them and sin and the fall entered into Adam and Eve, you immediately see that the result is Adam being a coward. You see him shunning his responsibility you see him separating himself from what um, he's embarrassed by, from what is going to you know, bring uh, any type of uh, negativity towards him in the eyes of God. He doesn't, have any, he doesn't want anything to do with it anymore. And I'm telling you guys, this is the trend of mankind ever since then as it pertains to wives and men's responsibility in marriage. So for a typical couple... You know, when does this happen? Well, I mean, it could happen at any, at any given moment, but the, 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 the enemy is after it from the jump start. Let's look at Genesis 2.25. So in Genesis 2.25, it says, And they were both naked, and the man and his wife were, were not ashamed. So this is before they eat. They're naked, and they're not ashamed, right? They don't know sin. They don't know... Um, what you and I would call embarrassment, right? They're not conscious of it. And so they go on, and 
they eat of the tree, and, the, and sin enters into mankind, and now we see that there's this eye-opening experience for them that's spiritual, right? Obviously, it wasn't their physical eyes that were opened. But on a spiritual level, they're, they're different now. So I'm going to read this because I didn't put it in here like I wanted it. So in 2, 24, and then Adam says, this creature is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall become united and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. He's describing the marriage process. That's what he's talking about right there, okay? Verse 25, and the man and his wife, this is uh, amplified version, uh, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not embarrassed and not ashamed. Genesis 3, 1, the next verse. Now the serpent, the next verse is about the enemy approaching Adam and Eve. So this demonstrates to us that the enemy is waiting for basically the vows to finish. From the time you walk off and you take your post-marital march down the aisle, out the church, the enemy is at work to undo and defile what God has made. Does that make sense? So from day one, from verse one of your marriage, you're under attack, right? And it describes here this, um, this conversation that begins between the enemy and Eve. So I would wonder why it is that Adam was so willing um, to abandon her? Was it pride? Was it fear? Was it, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what draws that out of any man. But we know that that was a course-changing thing for Adam when we go back and we read through the consequences that Adam and Eve paid for that choice to eat from the tree. But for Adam specifically, what do you think the difference in trajectory would have been for them had Adam said, hey, this was me? Hold on, God, wait a minute, wait a minute. You told me I was in charge. You turned the keys over. This was my bad. I should have listened. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Now what? And, and ask for grace and mercy from God in that conversation, right? I don't know what would have changed, but God's word as it pertains to forgiveness, right? And his grace and mercy endureth-ing. endureth-ing? I think that sounds like a chemical, endureth-ing. What's that thing burn, endureth-ing? Enduring forever? So, you know, it's interesting. The marriage is a covenant, right? You know that, that when God decided to make Eve and bring her into the earth, it was because Adam was weak. Adam was weak without her, right? So this was a completion process for her to be made and to couple them together, right? And it's interesting to think, just kind of a side of note from the story here, you know your marriage is a covenant? You know, so like back in the medieval times, family specialized in things. Like uh, Kyle's family might have been uh, agriculturally inclined. They might have had the tools and the resources to be, um, you know, sowers of the land, right? They might have understood that trade. They may have owned the land or had access to land that was fruitful, right? But um, uh, Wayne's family, they might have been hunters, and they understood that uh, craft, and they, un- they had the tools, and they had the resources, but then Jonathan's family may have been warriors, like they have, may have come from that lineage, and they may have had uh, 
the skill set to fight and defend. They may, you know, but, and so what would happen is families back in those times would make covenants with one another because they did not have the ability to do it all themselves, right? And it was in their differences that they found strength. So that fact that your wife doesn't think like you, that's your strength. That's not the weakness in your marriage, right? And I write that on my mirror all the time. <laughs> it's okay that she doesn't think like you. <laughs> Did she ever read it? Strike that from the record that I laughed. <laughs> but really, think about that. Think about the fact that, you know, God brought this woman into your life that is different from you for a reason. And it should be honored and valued. And I think we, should, we could shut it down right there and all ponder that for the remaining 30 minutes while Juan sings. <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. I'm going to call it pride. I think that when Adam took a bite of that apple and dishonored God because he thought he could do better than what God had done, it was pride that entered into him. And from that point forward, he didn't want anything to do with Eve out of pride. And pride, that stress and anxiety and all the negative things that you can imagine in your marriage right now, I promise you, is because of your pride. It's only going to get heavier from here. The marriage, if you think about it, from a statistical standpoint, um, in the world, you know, fails a lot. Uh, some people say 50%. I, from my studying, that number is a little bit inflated for wow factor. It's really closer to like 30 in the world. In the church, it's anywhere from 15 to 20% less than that for people that are very studious about practicing their faith. But here's an interesting stat that I found with, within um, the bigger picture that's, that is, uh, ca kind of caught me off guard. For those people that call themselves religious that aren't common or don't um, habitually practice their faith. So they're not praying. They're not at church regularly. They just call themselves, hey, I'm a Christian or I'm a Catholic or I'm a, pro or a you know, whatever, you know. For those people, divorce is like 20% more common. And I find that interesting that they're losing more in the, in the realm of their marriages even though they, for some reason, find it valuable to tag themselves with a title that probably makes them feel good about themselves, right? Um, but the truth be told, no matter where you fall in the spectrum, you are not going to be left to unhappily ever after. It doesn't exist. That thing we have in our culture, you know, that um, all the Disney movies are based off of, that all the little girls watch, that starts that cultural thought process that, oh, I'm going to meet my Prince Charming and we're going to get married and we're going to have this beautiful wedding in the forest and then I'm going to get to live in the big castle and then I'm going to get to be married forever and then it's going to be happily ever after, right? The serpent has something else to say about that. So you are not going to go home to a peaceful marriage at any point in your life for any extended period of time because the enemy of your life is a murderer. He's a thief. And you are a hunted man. And the destruction of your marriage is of great value to him because it is the destruction of the church. It is the destruction of your community, right? Okay. So here's a question. Adam and Eve hiding in the bushes, fig leaves sown. Are you living in what you would call a victorious marriage, or are you living in the fig leaves and the modern-day bushes of the world today in your marriage? 
Because the best thing this dude could do after being created in the garden, having the breath of God breathed into his lung, is hide in the weeds. That's what he had going for him with this woman that he was made the head of. Are we doing that in our marriages? I've been doing I've done it. Here's a piece of my testimony. So I was married for 10 years before I was married to Twyla. That marriage was a dumpster fire. Wonderful woman. I take 100% credit for that, how that went. But that was me, hiding in the bushes in my marriage. I had a reason why everything was not my fault. I didn't really understand that that's where I was at in my life at that point. I was young. I was immature. I was selfish. You know what I mean? I was very prideful. Um, and, you know, I just let the enemy of my, of my life walk into my house and set up shop, you know, and it started in here, right? And that's what he's trying to do with each one of us all the time. So uh, I was saved at eight, at the age of eight, been in church my whole life, um, and I didn't know anything about having a great marriage. Never had anybody offer to teach me. I was just supposed to know how to do it because I got married. Anybody ever have that feeling? Okay, so we kind of, kind of know what it feels like to struggle in marriage. Anybody ever know that feeling? Okay, so let's transition. Let's transition out of that struggle. So in order for you to do that, you have to own these issues. You have to own where you are in your marriage. You cannot control what you won't own. You can't take control of it. So we find this difficult as men because for most of the time, that means that all of that garbage that's going on, we really don't want it to reflect on us personally. So the question is, did you sign up for her level of crazy? Did you, Kyle? (laughs) <laughs> He's just down there quietly chuckling. <laughs> He's just quietly chuckling. My wife ain't crazy. That's the truth. Okay, how about this? Genesis 2, 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and they shall be one flesh. Yes, you did sign up for that crazy. And I think on the wedding night, everybody was excited about making it one flesh. Right? Sign me up. Hello. Okay, so let's go back to Ephesians 5.23. I'm going to rescue this. And in Ephesians 5.23, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And here's what's interesting about this. Jesus is used as the point of example, the standard bearer. Why didn't we choose like uh, Ruth and Boaz? Awesome marriage in the Bible, right? Or how about like even Joseph and Mary, Jesus' parents? Um, Jacob and Rachel? Why was Jesus the standard that was given for us as men on how to lead our wives? And I'll tell you why. It's because he was the only one selfless enough to be worthy of using as the standard. Okay? Because what you need to do for your wife is nothing short of what Jesus has done. That's what you're called to in your marriage. So what does it mean to love your wife as Christ loved the church? So Ephesians 5.25 is where we're commanded to do this. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. 
Okay, let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. And you guys are very familiar with this verse. It tells you what love is. Okay? It's long. I have it on my side of my mirror, right? I read it while I shave. I still don't have it memorized. So I guess I just keep, keep reading it. But you know God is love. So here's a question. That's not it. Four through seven. Let's go one more. That's all of it. Yeah, that's the beginning of it. Boom, love endures long, patient, kind, sorry. In my mind, Colby, that was all on there at the same time. <clears throat> so it never boils over as jelly. It's not boastful. It's not uh, vain. It's, it's, it doesn't display itself as haughtily. And so on. And it goes on in its right, its own way. It's for it's not self-seeking. And I mean, it just keeps telling us what love is. But God is love, right? So here's the thing. I'm going to read it to you like this. <clears throat> Let's combine this with what we know. Jesus was patient. Jesus was kind. Jesus was not envious. Jesus did not boast. He, Jesus was not worried about being honored. He wasn't self-seeking. He wasn't easily angered. He didn't keep a record of wrongs. He rejoiced in the truth. He always protected. He always trusted. He always hoped. And he always persevered. Do you do that for your wife? Because that's what you're asked to do. Just as Jesus loved the church, so are you to love your wife. Everybody, this is my disclaimer. I suck at this. All of these things I'm talking about. Any man that stands up here and tells you different, I, I want to meet him. I was just, I'm just like getting this out now because this is a hard message and it's not being spoken by a person that's good at it. But it's God's word. That's what we're here to do, right? So what wasn't there? Jesus doesn't blame. He doesn't point fingers. He doesn't stop communicating. He doesn't make excuses. He doesn't give up. He doesn't quit. He doesn't turn a cold shoulder. He doesn't abandon her. Jesus didn't do any of that to the church. Have I ever done that to my wife? Yeah. These are things that are not options for us as Christian men that are trying to honor God in our marriage, right? So for those issues that we can impact in our conversations, in our finances, in the times that we spend with our wife, in our temper, in our forgiveness, in our patience, in our reactions, Jesus is the standard bearer. So what do we do with the things that we can't control? Because, yeah, I mean, Jesus is the standard, but at the same time, it's like, I could go home and work on that the rest of my life. But then there's, Joe, there's the things I can't control. Like, I don't know why she says that to me. I don't know why she calls me that. In the heated moments, those words should never leave a woman's mouth. I don't know why she keeps spending money on that stuff. I don't make those choices. Like, how do I get her to stop choosing her family over me? Or whatever it is in your marriage. Why is it that she keeps taking the kid's side? She doesn't honor me as her husband. She's more worried about protecting her own children instead of honoring her husband. Like, I don't get it. And you know what? Here's the deal. You can't understand it. You didn't bring on those issues in your life with her. Those came with her. Because the enemy is at work in her just like he's at work in you and there's things that you can't fix. So what do we do with those things? We do what Jesus did and we become the conduit through which those things can be solved. So let's go to 1 John Two, two. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So Jesus was the propitiation of our sins. What does that mean? He basically made it good. He paid the price. He resolved the issue of our sin with God. Okay? He became the conduit through which we could be saved. And that is what we need to be for those areas of our lives with our wives that we cannot fix ourselves. We have to be the conduit through which God can work in our marriages and with our wives. Just like Jesus was the conduit through which God could begin to work with us. Okay? So how do we do that? Let's, let's 
<clears throat> look at how Jesus says we're supposed to do that. Mark 9, 29. What this looks like is prayer, intercession, and fasting. Okay? So Jesus says, so he said to them, this is the disciples, the story goes, they basically go out and get beat up by this spirit, right? This uh, demon, they can't exercise this demon. And they're like, hey, we had pretty good success before, why can't we handle up on this one? And he says, this kind can come out only by nothing but prayer and fasting. So he's told the disciples, when you come across a spiritual issue that you can't handle, that you can't cast out and take authority over, prayer and fasting is how you handle it. And this is how you have to handle things in your marriage. You get on your face and you say, God, you got to do this. Anybody ever fasted for their wife? For an issue in your marriage? So there's things that our logic can't fix. You know, men are fixers. There's things that going and talking to our family about it can't fix. There's things that Oprah can't fix. There's things that self-help books can't fix. Only the word of God. So through humility, humility, we see that we position ourselves for this. Proverbs 11, 2, and uh, Colby, I messed this up. This was, I put it to you, eleven twenty one, and it should be eleven two. So I, I don't know how, how um, well, <laughs> yeah. when pride comes, then comes shame. But with humble, with the humble is wisdom. And then let's look at 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn, their wicked, turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal them from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Humility brings God's power into your life. So your marriage is under attack. We understand that how Jesus created an avenue for us as sinners to be saved. We understand that we're to love our wives that way. We're to lead that way, and, we're to, and we understand that we can't fix everything. Now, you can go home tonight, and you can be what love is. You can be patient. You can be kind. You can be persevering. You can be hopeful. You can be forgiving. You can be uh, not prideful, not haughty. You can go and do all those things to the best of your ability, but when you run into those things that you can't handle, it's going to be time in the prayer closet, time with God, turning those things over that make a difference. So this last area is where I want to kind of see us in, and that's in confidence. In ownership, there's authority. Uh, I own my truck, and I get asked daily if it can be driven. If you haven't reached that phase of your life yet, look forward to that. Dad, can I drive? It's my truck. No. Every now and then it's yes, few and far between. You know, there's an assignment on your life. You realize that your wife was brought into your life to get that done. You are not a complete, you are not empowered to complete that mission without her. So our flesh is against us. Romans 8, 7. We can't lead from our instincts and emotions because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God nor indeed can be. You as a fleshly man cannot lead from within yourself. You know, your flesh wasn't given authority. Your spiritual being was. Your authority comes from who you are as a spirit man. That's the part of you that has authority. Luke 10, 19. 
Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and, and over all power of the enemy, and nothing shall be any, by any means hurt you. So you have it. What are you doing with it? And this is what I'm going to implore you to do. You can own your marriage, your assignment. You can stop being Adam. And only you know where you're being Adam in your life. Only you know where you are squatting away and cowering away from your responsibility in your marriage. Only you. I know where mine are. So, the steps to it. First thing is this, 1 John 4. <clears throat> Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. A long time ago, I was having an issue, and God came to me and he said, Joe, you need to understand that the way you initially react is your flesh. It's not me. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, yeah, so when you get angry, when she says what she says, that's your flesh. When you get offended, when you get hurt, that's your flesh. If you think about it, guys, you start testing the spirit. So when you get into that altercation or that frustrating moment and that thing comes upon you and sits on you and starts eating at you and you start thinking about what it is that she's done this time or what it is that was said or wasn't said or left undone or did, you start thinking, you test that spirit. Is that of God? I bet it ain't. I bet that's the carnal side of our being being attacked by the enemy. So we need to take time in those moments. Then the Bible say something about how easily a man is angered. You know, you know, give some reflection on his character and who he is. And I know for me, I had to start really slowing down in those moments because, man, I would fly off the handle. I would tailspin into things that were so destructive because I wouldn't take that spirit captive. And that's exactly what we have to do. The next thing is this. You need to take authority. Spoken word that covers our wives and our lives is how we take authority. Remember when Jesus told Paul, get behind me, Satan? Paul, right? Peter, thank you. Jesus, yeah. You guys ever talk to yourself? So when, this time, when those spirits come upon you, this is it. Right? Just like I did here tonight. Dear Holy Father, in Jesus' name right now, I'm not listening to this. I'm not doing this. I'm not getting on this crazy cycle of anger with my wife. And in Jesus' name, I bind this spirit. Whatever this is right now is not of God, and I'm not putting up with it. And this is what's happening in my garage. You know what I mean? And then I open up my toolbox drawer, and I slam my fingers till I can start listening to myself because you guys know, right? The last thing you want to do when you're mad is go in the garage and start self-talk and taking authority over, you know, anything. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is not our normal first reaction. And one, I'm going to let you guys come up if you don't mind because uh, I'm running over time. But the bottom line is, is that you have to take authority. And the last thing is this. I want you to start to communicate with your wives. The most powerful thing you will do in your marriage is to go home tonight and set her down on the edge of the bed and you get down on your knees in front of her and say, this is, this is my fault. She'll say what? And you'll say all of it. If it's negative, I own this. I'm the leader here. And I didn't create this problem, 
but I'm willing to work with God and you to fix it. And only you know what that is because you got that spot in your marriage, in your life. You know what I'm saying? That's a humility level that empowers you to take your marriage to the next level, to be the leader that Jesus was to the church in your life. So God has a heart for your marriage, and no matter where you are, he has the ability to redeem it. What serpents have you led into the garden of your marriage? You know, when Adam saw the serpent interfacing with Eve, he had the authority right then to take care of that problem. Right then. But he didn't take it. He let that serpent speak until it was too late. Somebody said one time, how long are you going you gonna, to, uh, you know, be tangled up in that sin? And the guy said, I don't know. And that pastor responded, I guarantee you it'll be just this much too long. Because that's how long sin keeps you. It's just this much too long until it's too late. Where have you been, Adam, instead of Jesus? Where have you chosen yourself and protecting yourself in self-preservation over the leadership of your wife? I hope this has been helpful. It's hard. It's a hard message. But I think it's empowering. I want to just close my part out because they're going to work, we're going to worship, but by praying for Randy, um, he fell at work today, uh, hurt his arm, uh, Randy, and um, some Baker, some of you guys know, and I um, just want to lift him up in prayer um, just for his healing, and so if you'll just bow your heads, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight, we thank you for this opportunity to get into your word, and in that word is healing. It's wholeness. It's power. We thank you for these men that are willing to stare themselves in the mirror and cover themselves in your love and work and sweat through the refinement of who they are in you. And I just pray for each one of them and their conversations with their wives as they go forward, the conversations they have with themselves, that you would just encourage them. Give them the peace that it takes to be bold and confident as they make choices. We lift up Randy to you tonight, Father. We just ask that every part of his body would come into perfect alignment with your design that he would have comfort and peace as he's healing. And we just thank you for his 100% recovery in advance. In Jesus' name, amen.